Hey, everybody. Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com, back again for another chapter of Hope and Help for Your Nerves with the lovely Holly. Hey. Hey, Holly. How's it going? Hey, good. Thanks. <laughs> so today we are going to talk about, wait, quick recap. If you're not following along with us reading the Claire Wooks, Weeks book that Holly just held up, Hope and Help for Your Nerves, go get the book. It's cheap everywhere and yep. uh, follow along with us. So we are going chapter by chapter, sort of weekly, kind of, as best as we can. And uh, today we're up to chapter five. Chapter five is entitled, and this is probably exciting for a lot of people, Cure cure of the Commonest Kind of Nervous Illness. And we've talked about how Dr. Weeks ta- calls this nervous illness the old-fashioned, like an old-fashioned term. But she does specifically use the word cure. So yeah. maybe we should talk about that for a minute. Like, what, you know, I know everybody's going to get really excited when they hear that we're talking about a cure, but maybe we should qualify that to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, cure kind of suggests it's more of a an illness in a traditional sort of sense of the word, and it's like a like a cure, like here's the magic cure, and you'll never get that illness again. Which it sort of is, but it isn't. I don't know. I don't know how to sort of talk about it. No, it's it's true, and I think um, people are always looking for a cure. You know, they want to be cured. I want this to stop. I want this to go away. I never want this to happen again. So they start to start to look at anxiety and panic issues as something that you would try and knock down, like as if you had the flu or you had, you know, an actual physical disease of some kind where you can cure it with some sort of medication or change something about your body. And it never, and it just goes away forever. And I think that might be a bit of a misnomer here. I'm not sure that, you know, that that's what we're talking about. When you accept the fact that you're being, being kept sort of ill by your own actions then it makes much more sense saying it's a cure because you have to change your actions and your reactions in order to cure yourself so once you once you accept that you are sort of unwillingly sort of doing this to yourself in the first place without meaning to of course then once you can accept that then you can sort of like learn how not to do that to yourself and in that sort of sense of the word is a cure Yes, that's very true, but it's a different kind of cure, so it's really important to keep that in mind. There's no magic wand in the book here uh, that's going to magically make it all just go away. There's, you know, so the, your word cure should be probably be taken with a bit of a grain of salt here, but that is the way she entitles the chapter, Cure of the Commonest Kind of Nervous Illness. So it's a tiny little chapter in the book. It's literally it's a weird. page it's printed two page, yeah, yes, two sides. on my phone. I have to flip maybe three times and in the Kindle app to read the whole thing, but it's, it's tiny, it's but that's it. yeah, that's it. It's so small, but it is actually the foundation upon which her whole philosophy is built. So I think it deserves its own 20 minutes or so. So we'll go through it um, because she lays out the four, her sort of four cornerstones, I guess we can call them of how to get through these, these issues and how to get past them, how to learn to master them and how to learn to live a normal life again. So I guess let's talk about it. You know, you, you started yeah. with a good note. It's too simple for me. Let's talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, she says that lots of people that will read the book will say when they read the four things of what you're supposed to do, they're just like, this is far too simple for me. Obviously, I'm suffering it much worse than anyone that is, this book is meant for. So therefore, it's going to take something much more drastic to cure me. And she says, like, it isn't. <laughs> and just because it's simple, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Like, just because these four things that you do, it sounds so simple when you say what, it, what you're supposed to do. But it, simplicity doesn't mean that it's easy. They're two different things. That is 100% correct. I say it all the time. It's a really simple plan, but it could be really hard to execute yeah. um, because of what it, it takes. So I guess we'll get into it. She talks about her principles of treatment. And it's such a simple plan. And she talks about four things. And they are uh, facing accepting, floating, and letting time pass. And each one of those things we could probably talk for an hour about easily. Yeah. Uh, because each one is its own skill that you have to first understand what it is and then start to learn actually how to do it consistently and with good results. So I think the biggest issue here that most people have when they, they start to look at this and, well, this is what I have to do, is that it is exactly 180 degrees opposite of what yeah. you think you should be doing. So we should probably touch on that because that is, that is a huge impediment to many, many, many people. Completely counterintuitive when you first get started with this, completely. Yeah, absolutely, because the whole, the whole so like she, she, she sort of like says it as well in the book. She goes through how a person 
ends up doing the complete opposite. So she says, like, let's look at the person that she described in the previous chapter, like the typical sufferer of nervous illness. Mm -hmm. And so they become, first of all, they become like unduly alarmed by their symptoms. And so they start like listening in to like their heartbeat and checking that they're still breathing and questioning exactly what everything in their body, what's happening to them is. And, and so like, they end up tensing against it and sort of trying to fight the feelings because they don't want to feel the feelings. And so they tense against it and they try and like fight it or they completely try and distract themselves. We all know lots of people use distraction mm -hmm. sort of techniques to sort of get through, which can be handy in the short term, but long term it doesn't really help because if you're distracting yourself from it, you're running away from it. And so the whole first principle is the facing Right. And if you're not, if you're trying to fight it or you're trying to, if, well, if you're running away from it, then you're not facing it. And so like, that's like the first thing that you're doing wrong. And I think facing is an interesting sort of dichotomy, if you will, because we become so overly sensitized to everything we think and feel when we're in that elevated anxiety state all the time that we're constantly listening like you said we're keen, keenly aware of every sensation in our bodies we're hypersensitive to all of it we're hyper vigilant for changes we're just ruminating on every thought we have we're engaging in inner, dia inner dialogue yet even though we're listening in and watching and feeling so much we're not actually really facing it as crazy as no. that sounds so we're keyed in on everything that we're feeling but we're not really facing it so I think we're, we're listening in and watching we're on guard so that we can run yeah, and yeah so we're, we're watching yet we're not facing and I think to me, I think facing is the hardest part of this because it's the part where you say, okay, I'm just going to let it come at me here and I'm not going to try and run away from it. And that's where courage comes in. And most people, I could talk about courage for all day long. It's just part of the equation. You can't not, you, you have to have some in order to get yeah. through this. It's just the way it is. And I think I always try and remind people that being courageous or being brave isn't about not being afraid. It's about being afraid, but doing it anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So people always say, well, I'm, I'm not brave at all. I'm terrified. Well, like brave people are terrified. A brave person, <laughs> right, faces their fear. And, and you have to always remember that the facing is so difficult because of the need to summon up courage. But in the end, nobody here, Dr. Weeks, you, I, nobody is asking anyone to face a real danger. No. Right. We're Nothing's not asking. Nothing's actually going to happen. That's exactly right. And it's so you have to, so important to remember that no one because sometimes when we talk about these things. When I talk about these things, people are like you're crazy. There's no way. Like, how could you make me do that? It's like, well, we're not really making you do anything, and nobody's asking you to stand up to a loaded gun or walk through fire. There's really yeah. no actual danger here. So, I think that's why facing is important, but the hardest part. And if you can't get into facing, you can't do the other three. But so. facing it also it's not as hard as you think it is like you kind of it almost doesn't take more courage it just takes a different sort of like um sort of way of thinking like i remember when i was still sort of like quite um sketchy and scared of flying you know like i never had like a full phobia of flying but i just obviously had really bad panic attacks of being on a plane wasn't sort of ideal when you're having a panic attack but like I used to sort of like do it anyway and I'd be sat on the plane like so tense just like god I've got to get through this and then I'd get to the end and be like oh god I made it and it's just like well of course you made it you could have sat there and just enjoyed a gin and tonic and watched a film and, and got there it's exactly the same flight nothing different would have happened because I'm sat there tense you know what I mean so like me just going like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling tense, but I'm sure it will pass. It's That's... very different to sort of sitting there going like, oh, God, I'm feeling so tense, but I'm sitting on a plane. It's exactly the same. Nothing different happens. You just feel better. <laughs> no, that, Holly, that's really an excellent, excellent point because – guess what? You're going to face it anyway. So exactly. if, if your heart is going to race, your heart is going to race. So it's going to happen no matter what. And like you said, the flight would have happened no matter what you did. So yeah. whether you slept the whole way through or you were in a complete panic the whole way through, this, the same thing was going to happen. So that's a really, really strong point. When it comes to that thing where you have to decide you're going to face the things that you are afraid, they're going to be there with you anyway. Um, the only thing I think people, the opposite of facing becomes avoidance. So I'm going to try and stop feeling like that at all. I, I don't want to feel like that at all. 
And uh, that becomes a problem. I think that's the biggest impediment to truly facing what you're doing is I'm yeah. just, just going to do whatever I have to do to make sure I never feel this way. And, well, then you wind up with a really shrunken lifestyle and restrictions and things that nobody likes. So, um, yeah, facing. Absolutely. You have to actually yeah. face it face. as opposed to face it. You can't avoid <laughs> it or can't run away from it. That's the way it's going to have to be. So number two that she talks about is accepting, which I yeah. think there's a subtle difference between facing and accepting, but there is a difference. Yeah, so she uses the example of, like, not accepting as being the, like, fighting it, you know? Like, if you're, so you're, like, she, like yeah, if you're, so I think you're not facing it if you're running away. Mm -hmm. And you're not accepting it if you're trying to fight it, you know? And it's sort of like the same thing, but I guess you could, like, you could maybe call, like, the facing, the running away thing, like, the distraction. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the fighting it, just like, oh, God, I'm sitting here and I'm feeling awful and I don't want to feel awful, but I'm feeling awful. Yes. <laughs> like, it's a sort of fighting it. And you're like, it's taken all my strength to get through this. And it's just like, actually, if you just did nothing and just let it happen, it would take less strength and it would pass quicker. And that's what you it that would help you much more in the long run, you know? Like, that's the accepting that is true know, accepting just, yeah okay <laughs> bring it on also like if you you dare it like uh, uh what really helped me is when i started like okay i'm at like a seven let's take it to a 10 you know like come on do your worst and yeah. as soon as you can accept it like that i mean the anxiety goes whoa whoa hang on I yeah go to a 10 <laughs> yeah that, to a two. <laughs> that's very true and i think accepting it really means truly, I mean, the word is obviously accepting, but not only is it not fighting, but it's truly deciding, okay, I am going to believe this rationally, even though emotionally I won't, that yeah. this is okay, it's actually normal, it's totally harmless, and even though it doesn't feel that way, I'm going to accept that to be true. So you have to start from that premise. So facing would be don't avoid it, you know, go into the situations that are going to make you anxious and afraid and panicky, and then accepting is... Don't go in it and just try and uh, grit and white knuckle your way through it. You're not powering your way through it. You should just be calmly moving through time as it goes past. And you said yeah. whether you do something or do nothing, I, what I usually say is, well, when a panic attack happens, you could do something or you could do nothing. And nothing is always faster than something. So, exactly. Right. So if you can truly do nothing, then you are absolutely accepting and, and knowing that, well, this is going to pass no matter what I do. And the less that I fight, the faster it will pass. So, yeah. yes, that's exactly what that is. So and I think that's a tough one, too. People don't, you know, they can't be, they don't accept it because it just seems incredulous that, I, that you would be asked to do that. Like, what do you mean I have to <laughs> accept it? Maybe that's a bad word. Like, I'm not going to accept this in my life. I don't want it in my life. I won't accept it. But it's not accepting that way. It's it's not like, hey, yeah, I love this. It's <laughs> it's accepting like, okay, I'm just going to accept it for what it is. Give it no more you know weight than what it is and, and just let it be there and it won't hurt me. So that's what accepting I think is all about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's the opposite of fighting. So um, we should move on to floating because I think this is – this is probably the weirdest Love one. Floating. Floating. It is weird. Once yeah. you get it, it's so good, though. <laughs> yes, but it's the weirdest one for people, I think, to put their brains around a little bit. Uh, to me, I, I, everybody interprets it a little different. I interpret floating as almost exactly what the word is. So this is also the opposite because if you're, you're going to face it, so you're not going to avoid it, you're going to go into those panicky situations, you're going to accept it by not fighting it. And how do you not fight it? You float. So floating is how you accept it. That's the way I look at it. Yeah, to yeah. me, it's, it's sort of just, I took it as like, just don't think about it. Don't just, you know, just mm -hmm. like, don't even think about it. When I was quite having a bad time at the beginning of this pregnancy, I was feeling really bad and I was like, you know, bit getting stored up stored up in the house. That's a weird way of putting yeah. it. I was not going out of the house. Sure, sure. And, um, and I just knew I needed to get out and I wanted to go swimming because I wanted to like keep doing exercise and sort of feel quite healthy and stuff. And so the pool is like on the other side of town. It's completely walkable. But I was just like, oh, I don't know. And it'd be like this big build up. Like, could I actually leave the house to go to the swimming pool? And then I was just like, oh, do you know what? I'm just not going to think about it. I'm just going to walk out the door like almost in like a sort of daze and just walk down this just one sort of step at a time but like I wasn't even thinking about it just and then before I knew it I was at the swimming pool and before I knew it I was then literally floating in the water yeah because she has a really nice bit it will move on to it in another chapter but when she talks about the floating in more detail she says like sometimes people like to imagine it as like 
sort of walking through deep, deep, cool water. And I would just be in the pool, just like, oh, I totally get what she means. Yes, <laughs> it's just yeah. like, like, literally, it is sort of just like floating. Just don't think about it. Just keep going and just, you know, let whatever's happening happen and mm-hmm. just carry on sort of thing. You know, it's not like a <laughs> carry on. It's just a hey, carry on. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you can face and you can accept, then only can you learn to float. So floating does incorporate accepting. You know, I'm just going to accept that it's here. I'm not going to fight it. And I think floating is where the actual skill comes in. To me, facing and accepting are more mental. Like, okay, I'm, I'm going to decide to put myself in that, that anxious situation, like going to a supermarket or whatever it is. You know, accepting is also a mental thing. Okay, I'm going to – it's a frame of mind. But floating are where the actual skills come in. Yeah. So, so like you said, moving through cool water – uh, not thinking about it, but that's a skill. You have to learn how to let your thoughts come and go without engaging them. You have to learn how to breathe properly. You have to learn how to relax your muscles. You have to learn how to do stay in the moment. You have to learn how to take one step at a time. Like you said, walking to the pool, how to s- deliberately slow everything down when all you want to yeah. do is run like crazy. So this is where floating is the mechanics to me of a, a lot of the mechanics of exposure in CBT are in floating. This is when yeah. you, you learn to do that. Like, I, I'm going to let the thought, oh, my God, is going to come in my head, but I'm not going to answer it. I'm just going to let it go out the other exactly. side. Exactly. A lot of it for me is about, like, not engaging with it. So, like, mm-hmm. like because I think a lot of the time people have as much problems as they have with their physical symptoms. It will be, like, the thoughts that they're having, sort of, like, intrusive thoughts. So, you know, like, you get these anxious thoughts, mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, and what if this, and what if that, and what if that? And you try and, people make the mistake of trying to answer those questions. So whether they try and reassure themselves or they seek reassurance from someone else, even if you're trying to reassure yourself and go like, no, no, that can't be the case because of logic and this and that, you're still engaging with the answer. It's like a sort of annoying child saying like, hey, hey, tell me this, tell me this. And you're going like, well, this, this. And they just keep asking and keep asking. And if you actually ignore them, then they'll eventually like, stop and so like it's about that sort of disengagement just like i'm not going to answer this this Mm -hmm. question you know i'm not so you're like i always try and think if you like try and make the thought that you're having into a question and then you just let it sit there but you don't answer it you don't try and reassure yourself you don't try and go oh yeah maybe it is you know (laughs) you just go like "Mm." Fair question. Not going to answer it. Yeah, yeah. Ask all <laughs> you want. Not even going to think about it. <laughs> that's very <laughs> and true. That's hard. Yeah, and that's really hard to do. I think it's the hardest part because that's a mental skill. Whereas some of the other skills, that being able to find tension in your body and release it, or be able to slow down your physical movement, become deliberate, stay in the moment. There's a thing called walking meditation that sometimes helps. Knowing how to breathe. Those are physical skills that you have to learn and practice. You have to practice. But the the mental skill of I call it the inner dialogue. Just do not have an inner dialogue with yourself. Like you said, do not answer yourself. So it's important, though, to understand when people say, you know, what do you mean don't think about it? How can I not think about it? Well, you can think about it. Go ahead and think about it. Like it's okay to have that thought that says. Yeah, don't try and stop the thought. Right. Don't, Don't try and stop it. It's okay to think, what if I'm having a heart attack this time? What What if this time it's really something wrong? You can ask that question in your head. Just don't. Just don't respond. Yeah. And let the question be asked a million times in two minutes if it has to be. Just don't answer. Do not just let your – just be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, it doesn't care what the answer is. It will keep coming back that's otherwise. exactly right. There is no answer <laughs> other than not to answer. That's the only way to do it. And I think uh, in terms of practical things, which I'm sure we'll touch on down the road as we get into the specifics, learning basic meditation skills are huge here. And really, and for many people, meditation is the act or, or the skill of learning to quiet your mind and your thoughts on demand. So if you can learn to quiet your mind, not only will it help you here, but it has benefits in a lot of other places. Whenever, you know, when, when the shit's hitting the fan, pardon my French, around here, uh, you know, my business or whatever, I have learned to just stay quiet and calm. And wow, what a difference that makes in life, not just in this. So you yeah. start, you become a superhero. So learn this. Learn this. Oh, yeah. When yeah. you learn these things, and, and like nothing is very difficult, nothing. is it? Once you've got yourself better from That's this, exactly it's right. just like, oh, God, uh, life is so easy. Are the buildings on fire? All right, no problem. We're going to get, let's get up and walk out. How's that? <laughs> so, you know, you just, you, it does get a little bit better. So floating is huge. Floating is huge. And uh, the last one, letting time pass. This is a tough one for me. 
I'm impatient. I think everybody, <laughs> if you're especially if you're suffering on a daily basis, you're you're yeah. anxious all the time. You're panicking everywhere. You're stuck in your house. Maybe you become agoraphobic. You know, let, being patient is the last thing you want to do. I, I mm. get. I totally get that. You want to be better today, but unfortunately, that doesn't work that way. You know? I think as soon as I sort of realized that that like trying to do these things like face and accepting and floating were like practicing I'm a musician so I know all about practice if I sit down at the piano I try and play something and I can't play it I get immense satisfaction out of just doing it again and again and again until eventually I can play it and I'm like oh I never used to be able to do that and now I can that's amazing so I like really enjoy practice mm -hmm. and like I really admire like I just know how much practice does you know and so as soon as I sort of like saw it as practice it just made a lot more sense and so it makes sense that of course you're not gonna like oh right I know that I've got to accept face and float now that's fine I'm better it's just like you're not gonna be better you can't just sit down and go like oh well I heard that Beethoven piece and now I can play it no you're gonna have to practice and practice and practice it right until you're my, until my fingers are doing it without my brain even knowing you know and so you because in in like neuroscience as well the more you sort of do something a certain way your brain wires it that way mm -hmm. and unfortunately when you're suffering this nervous sort of suffering your brain's wired itself to react in this in the bad way in the opposite way to what you need to be doing yes and so you have to work extra hard to try and change to go to the opposite but the more that you do it they say firing's wiring and so every time it fires that way it yeah. starts to like rewire itself that's why people who have had like severe brain injuries and stuff like that they have to relearn how to walk or to talk and stuff but eventually they do and then eventually like the brain finds a different route and rewires it's very clever <laughs> it, it is the human brain is incredibly adaptable it's ridiculous yeah, it's really very adaptable. It. yeah and i think sadly we have to acknowledge the fact that you can learn and, and, and i say this all the time that i think anxiety disorders and panic disorder agoraphobia these are really cognitive and learning problems i like to call them illnesses they're really just cognitive learning they're bad habits is what they are they're bad cognitive habits the Absolutely. bad news is that the way we come wired from the factory you can learn to be afraid of a trip to the supermarket <laughs> within 10 minutes you yeah. can develop that phobia very quickly sadly you can't undevelop develop you develop, you can you can't it's because our brains are so adaptable and plastic but uh they but unfortunately it takes longer to unlearn it than it does to learn it it's just yeah maybe the survival instinct is wired in us very strongly but uh but you can unlearn it so oh, totally, yeah. but and it just takes a tremendous amount of practice so uh, what i try and tell people all the time is that every every time you practice that even though you may think it's a failure, if you did engage the process and you worked those four steps and you worked your skills, you did make some step forward. You really yeah. did. So even when, when you sit down at that piano, even the third or fourth time you try that piece, you still can't play it, but you did make some progress. Definitely. Even if it sometimes feels like you go backwards a little yep. bit, like yep. it doesn't matter. You're not actually like it's, it's still come. It will. You have to just keep going forwards and practicing and practicing. You can't go like, oh, I went backwards and I didn't play as quite as well this time as the last time. Right. I better stop playing it. It's just like, no, then you keep playing it even more, you know, mm -hmm. and um and like, so I think people make the mistake as well of thinking that like every time they don't feel anxiety or don't have a panic attack, like, oh, brilliant, I haven't had a panic attack for two weeks. You know, this is fantastic. It's like, yeah, but you've not done any practice in Bingo. that case. Yes, that's right. So like, oh, I haven't played the piano for two weeks, so I haven't made any mistakes. Like, yeah, but you've also not learned how to play the piece, though, have you? <laughs> that, that is such an important part of the concept of letting time pass. I think being patient and there's also being tenacious practicing all the time but if you're not willing to let time pass so that and be willing to practice you have to you have to almost invite the anxiety in yeah. because it's not people want to claim victory if they didn't feel anxious and that's great you don't want to feel anxious oh yeah it gives you a break and it, it's it so does nice. exactly but this doesn't that doesn't necessarily solve the problem you're better off to feel anxious and work the process and practice yeah. but i think that's that's kind of letting time pass at the macro level where maybe if you're stuck in the house it might take you a few weeks or a month or something of practice to to be comfortably get out of the house again but at the micro level i think if you look at one specific you know, either panic attack or, or episode of high anxiety, letting time pass is 
is germane there too. So yeah. within the context of a given panic attack, you the natural instinct is to want to stop it instantly in its tracks. But you, especially if you're in full blown panic, that's not going to happen. Once the adrenaline is dumped, sorry, it's gonna have to run its course. So you have to be able to float and let time pass for those six, seven, ten minutes, whatever it is. And yeah. just accept that it's going to take you that time. You just go like, I'm going to feel pretty crap for the next 20 minutes. Exactly. So I'm just going to like take it easy while whilst yep. this panic, not like to try and stop this yes. panic attack. That's sometimes the difference between those distraction techniques is that like people use the color in books or something. So they might say like, if I color in, then I won't be thinking about my anxiety. So it might go away. But if you sort of like switched it and went like, I'm just going to color in whilst I feel anxious just because it's, you know, something to do. It's something whilst to pass the time. I'm whilst I'm feeling anxious, I'm yeah. going to do this, you know, in the meantime, I'm going to do this, then that's, it sounds like a really subtle difference, but I think it's like a really big one. It's yeah. like, it's not, I'm not going to color to, to try and stop having a panic attack. It's like, I'm going to just color whilst I'm having a panic attack. I think that, <laughs> that's that combines, a very big difference. It, it is a huge difference. It's subtle, but it's huge. And it combines, I think, accepting and floating. You can use the coloring book if you want as a tool to help you learn to float as long as you're truly accepting that what you feel is normal, natural, and won't hurt you. So as opposed to using the coloring book isn't saving you. So as long as you're not thinking that the coloring book is going to somehow save you from something that need you need to be rescued from, then go ahead and color. You know, color, yeah. walk, play an online swim. Poker. I play online poker play co- if right. I'm <laughs> Whatever, that's fine. And I, I think we, we'll all develop our own repertoire, I guess. But you, yeah. just, you just have to be really cognizant of the fact that those can become safety behaviors. Like, if you get to the point where you feel like, if I don't have that coloring book with me, I'm in trouble. Oh, yeah. You can't no. ever get to that point. So um, It doesn't save you. It's just it's literally just something to do whilst you're having a time waster, if you will. Attack. Yes, just yeah. let the, the time has to pass, so just might as well color or play cards or whatever. I, honestly, now, if I feel myself getting anxious, I'm just like, oh, maybe I could play poker because I'm feeling a bit crappy, so it's kind of a nice excuse. <laughs> it's, it's a reason to play a game. That is so funny. Bad habits come out. <laughs> oh, honey, I lost last month's rent. Uh, <laughs> my poker, but whatever. Um, all right, so I mean, that's it. Those are the four tenets that she talks about facing, accepting, floating, and letting time pass in this little tiny two page chapter of the book. But it's maybe the most important chapter. I'll probably say that in every chapter, so just bear with me, I guess. But these yeah. are the four tenets. And just, you know, to recap, I think we're looking at facing and accepting as sort of mental constructs, frame of mind constructs. Floating are the actual skills that you need to learn to deal, to relax into your anxiety and panic as opposed to fighting it or, you know, just enduring it. And then letting time pass is mental also. It's just being patient at the micro level during a panic attack and being patient at the macro level as your life begins to improve at a big scale. Yeah, it occurred to me when I was making the notes for this chapter just now, I, it, as I was sort of like reading the like, okay, you mustn't fight it and you mustn't run away from it. It's just like, oh, that's kind of like everyone knows the fight or flight, like the words fight or flight that you get with the adrenaline. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of like it's an easy way to remember what you're not supposed to do. Don't flight, don't fight. Very good. <laughs> yes, very don't good. Don't run away, don't yeah. fight. So like, because sometimes the hardest bit is to remember what you're supposed to be doing when you're panicking because everything just goes, Wah. Sure, sure. So, so it- it's like trying to hang on to those little pieces of like, just like fight and flight. Okay, don't fight and flight then that means and then you can break it down like what does that mean okay don't run away from it so don't distract yourself from it and don't fight it don't tense up against it don't try and not feel it you know yeah just relax and just help try and remember what to do in the next time fight or fight don't fight don't Don't fight fight. i like it that's really good that's actually really good so uh i think we pretty much covered it we're going to talk about this a lot as we go forward because in the next chapter she I mean, what she really kind of, the next chapter is like the cure for your recurring, you know, or your always oh, present the more symptoms. Common, she yeah. sort of takes you through the lots of the symptoms and sort of how you can sort of learn to just face that particular symptom, you know, like how she sort of like takes away the mystery of the, the yes. symptoms. I mean, she can't hit every symptom, but uh, I think she uses certain symptoms as examples of what to do. Yeah. And she will look at it. Chapter The next chapter is she's addressing the constant symptoms. So when you're always in that elevated level of anxiety, maybe your stomach is always kind of rumbling or your heart rate seems like it's elevated all day long. So she looks at that. And then in the chapter after that, she actually looks at how to 
how to address a, a panic attack. I mean, she calls it something different. Um, but so she's looking at sort of that generalized background anxiety. And then in the chapter after that, she talks about how to deal directly with, I am flipping pages virtually. Oh, recurrent like, of nervous, nervous, nervous atta attacks. attacks so many, like, <laughs> so like 1950s. But yeah, so. Excuse me, I'm having a nervous attack. I'm having attack. a nervous attack, thank you. I, I do believe I have the vapors. But um, <laughs> so anyway, she breaks it down into two different things, the kind of, sort of the background anxiety and then an actual panic attack, or what she calls a nervous yeah. attack. So in the next two chapters, we'll look at those things, and I'm sure there'll be a lot more detail on the facing and accepting and floating and letting time pass. So anything else? Are we good? I think we're good, yeah. We are good. We are good. All right, another one in the facing, books. Accepting, yes. floating. Time pass. Yes, don't flight, don't fight, don't flight. Um, <laughs> that's really good advice. So we, uh, as always, comments, questions, whatever you can. If you're watching on YouTube, just comment right in the video. And you know, maybe if you're watching on YouTube, I don't know, like the video. I never ask people to do that. You're supposed to. I'm like the worst YouTuber in the world. I don't ask anybody to subscribe. I don't ask anybody to like. So yeah, like and subscribe, I guess. And you're um, supposed to like point to like the banner that you're going to be putting. Right. Up. You know, we'll, oh, we'll, we'll link it in the this, description. That. All, that's what all the cool kids do. I, I wanna, I'm not cool. What am I going to say? So um, yes, yeah, so if you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and comment. I will check in on there once in a while. Twitter at that anxiety guy. Facebook that anxiety guy. I'll make sure Holly's in on all of that stuff. And I guess that's it. We'll see you guys next time. Cool. All right. See you later. Bye. Oh, no. Now I have to actually end the recording. This is the awkward part where Drew has to find the, the recording end. All right. Bye. <laughs>